Eric Darling here with Darling Data Enterprise Edition. And uh, today I'm going to show you uh, how I log and analyze blocking using a couple store procedures that I wrote all by myself from scratch. Uh, the first one is uh, called SP underscore human events. Uh, I wrote that one to uh, make it easier for uh, SQL Server users to uh, set up important human events for different sort of performance um, performance issues. Uh, it does like uh, query stuff, uh, wait stats, blocking, compiles, and recompiles. Uh, those are the sort of important ones, the most common ones that I end up troubleshooting, so that's what I geared it towards. Um, I don't really have any plans to add more because uh, I don't really end up troubleshooting more than that. I don't care about your AG failover, personally. Just, I don't care about AGs, personally. Uh, so I'm going to show you uh, how I do that. And uh, all of the code from this section here, which is all you need, will be available at this GitHub gist. Uh, I don't expect you to copy this URL from the screen. I'm going to include it in the... Uh, I'm going to include it in the uh, video description, and um, I'm also going to uh, link to the uh, necessary scripts in my GitHub repo. Uh, of course, if you find any issues, you need support, you hit errors, you have problems, you have questions, that GitHub repo is also the best place to go and ask there. All right, so let's get down to it. Uh, I have this, these couple commands right here uh, that run... Uh, SP configure so that uh, we can turn on the blocked process report. The blocked process report is what drives information being fed into the extended event that we're talking about. Uh, so I would uh, I already set this up a little bit so I don't have to do a bunch of goofy crap on camera. But uh, if I run this and this sets up the blocking event type, and it also uses um, uh, a, a parameter that I like called keep alive. So SP human events can do one of two things. It can either capture uh, stuff from the stuff that I mentioned before, uh, query, performance, wait stats, blocking, compiles, and recompiles for a specified duration of time, or you can use this keep alive parameter to set up a, a session that just keeps on running. Um, so if you're not sure when to expect something happening, uh, that can be a good idea. I wouldn't suggest <laughs> leaving a lot of these on for a long time because extended events... Um, you know they they can they can cause some observer overhead. I know that Microsoft has taken some steps to alleviate that, but especially query performance ones. I'm capturing actual execution plans because a lot of the times that's what I need to do. Um, so I wouldn't suggest leaving uh, those running forever and ever. Um, it could be could be detrimental. But the blocking one is pretty straightforward and easy. So um, I already have this set up. A uh, few come over here and we look at all the stupid stuff I have on my server and we go into management and we go into extended events and hopefully I don't have anything uh, nefarious or weird in these um, in the in, in my extended event names but uh, if we come on oh boy zoom it just like got weird on me all right there so uh, I have one to the c capture deadlocks I actually have um, a, uh, a duplicative one up here. I guess I could have used that instead. I didn't look first. Uh, but I have this uh, keeper underscore human events underscore blocking session. That's the default name that uh, SP human events will set up for a blocking session that is being kept alive. And uh, I've got a couple queries over in these windows. Uh, I just did a simple update for uh, one row to um, modify the age column. And uh, I can get rid of that because I'm, I'm done with that. And uh, I had one query over here that was just doing a select star from users looking for, for that same user ID so that it would get blocked under the default isolation level for um, every version of SQL Server other than Azure SQL DB, I guess. You have to be good. Uh, you have to be able to say something good about the cloud in these videos, right? Well, uh, anyway. Uh, so SB Human Events does use the ring buffer. Uh, as a <clears throat> target. It does not use file targets. Um, I decided to use that because it seemed a little bit easier to manage in code. Uh, I know that uh, Jonathan Cahayas, uh, the man who always has great weekends, um, that is not a, the biggest fan of the ring buffer, nor am I, but it's just a design trade-off that I decided to make. 
So anyway, uh, I let the, that blocking situation proceed for about five seconds, and then I ran uh, SP Human Events Block Viewer, and I got these results. Now, uh, some of this, some of the details that come back are sort of at the mercy of what the block process report captures. Um, for example, uh, we get the event time, we get the database name, and a lot of the t a lot of the times, this contentious object will resolve to the table or whatever that w the, the the blocking was taking place on. Uh, in this case, we got a really weird object ID back. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, but we we see uh, in these lines here uh, who did the blocking, who did who got blocked, uh, the spids. Uh, most like I know that a lot of this stuff doesn't exactly help you troubleshoot, like the blocking problem. I just wanted to get as much of the information out of the blocked process report as I could. Uh, like ECID, I don't I, I don't think I've ever actually used this to troubleshoot a blocking problem, but it's in there, so I get it out for you. Just in case you might need it at some point. Uh, we get the query text of the uh, blocking query and the blockhead query. You can see those there. Those are the queries that I just showed you in the other window. Uh, we get the total wait time, the status, the isolation level, uh, the lock mode. Note that the uh, query that does the blocking, uh, I don't think I've ever seen lock mode get populated there. Uh, I get out the SQL handles because I want you to be able, if you if you need to, to track down the query plans for the queries that um, that were involved in the blocking. So you'll have both the, you know, this, th these lines are, I mean, they're a little bit duplicative, but uh, we have the SQL handle for the, for, for both the blocking, you see the comma there, that's both uh, SQL handles for the blocked and blocking query. Uh, if there's a procedure name in there, I do try to resolve that as well. Uh, transaction count, the transaction name. Uh, one, that, one thing that shows up in here a lot that can be really useful is implicit transactions where, you know, you'll like, you know, uh, you know certain tools like the JDBC driver, the Python driver, use implicit transactions by default. You have to explicitly turn those off and like, not in the connection string, but like, in the connection code kind of uh, we get when the transaction started completed uh, we have all the client options in here sometimes client options can le uh, lend some insight into um, you know it's like uh, like a like a weird setting but these are both coming from SQL Server Management Studio so there's not really any weird settings uh, we get the wait resource uh, if there's a priority set if there's log used uh, stuff like that uh, we get the client app, host name, login name, transaction ID, which again isn't terribly useful, but it's in there. And then over here, I give you the full block process report. So uh, we look through here, like this object ID is obviously nonsense, so, you know, whatever. Um, this index ID of 256, I'm not sure that's entirely accurate, but there we have it. Um, <laughs> and coming down through some of the other stuff, uh, so SQL Server 2022 added a lot of these stacks in here. Um, these are probably not terribly useful for query blocking, at least that I've ever seen. They're probably more useful if you have like, you know, like background process blocking where you could really trace um, some of these call stacks to something a little bit more useful. Uh, and then we have the query that got blocked. We have the SQL handles that I was talking about and the query that uh, was doing the blocking down here. All right, so we get all that stuff, and uh, that's that can be really useful for figuring out what was blocking, you know, what your problem, what the problem was, all that other good stuff. Uh, and the bottom section kind of gives you a breakdown of all the like all the blocking that hap that has happened in the database that was captured that is currently in the ring buffer extended event. Um, so uh, a couple in here that I think are particularly useful for the scenario that we're looking at are lines uh, four and five right here. Uh, and these will tell you if you have uh, qu uh, blocking involving selects. So uh, under the default isolation level read committed, uh, write queries can block modification queries and modification queries can block select queries uh, unless you, I mean, let's litter all your, um, all your uh, select queries with no lock hints and whatnot, which, you know, um, is not a good idea. Please don't do it. Uh, I would pr much prefer that you need uh, use a good old-fashioned optimistic isolation level, some multi-version concurrency control, uh, like using read committed snapshot isolation. And uh, the second one is that there is a sleeping query 
doing the blocking. Uh, if you have queries that are regularly sleeping and still blocking, there is uh, often signals uh, some sort of um, application error where you are not closing out uh, uh, connections when you should. Um, this will also warn you about implicit transactions, a lot of other stuff. There's a ton of uh, checks in there for various like different things that are weird, like if you have odd oddball isolation levels, like repeatable read or serializable getting involved. You know, it can be a good idea to, to warn about those because. Um, the, at least I, I want to say with entity framework, um, when you use the transaction scope, I don't know, is it method or whatever, uh, that sets a pretty strict isolation level. Um, I can't remember if it's re repeatable, read, or serializable by default, but it's, it's one of those. So it'll give you all that information. It'll show you all that good stuff. And uh, this, I, I, I don't know, I use this quite regularly with client work to, uh, try to help me um, you know, be able to troubleshoot uh, blocking issues and all that and uh, I don't know that's uh it's about it there um, you know it'll tell you how much blocking there is and you know um, uh, for the entire database and then per object and all that other good stuff so uh, you know uh, pretty good all right pretty good all right cool so uh, I'm gonna keep recording some more of these videos uh, these are gonna be pretty short um, I'll probably be sort of repetitive because I don't know who's gonna watch what when you might find one video and, and, and watch that you might find uh, you might watch a whole series of videos I don't know how it's gonna work I don't know I don't know what you're gonna do with your life or your day or your great weekend but uh, anyway I will catch you in the next video uh, I, I again uh, please use this stuff I spent a lot of time writing it not just for me to benefit but for everyone to benefit it's, open source hippie stuff. So uh, yeah, and, uh, enjoy. Uh, use it. Report errors to me on GitHub. Good stuff. All right. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.